Hi, everyone. I think we're going to get started. I want to welcome everyone to the Standing Committee on Offshore Wind Energy and Fisheries. This is our uh, sponsor meeting uh, briefing with BOEM. Caroline, can you move slides? So my name is Jim St. Oh, I'll actually introduce myself. My name is Jim St. Kiriko. I'm faculty at the University of California at Davis, and I am uh, chair of the committee. And I'm just going to start us off uh, sort of outlining some of the meeting goals we have today. In terms of meeting logistics, um, given everybody's interest in this, it's great. I see on my screen, I can see almost 300 participants. That's amazing. We don't typically get that much interest at some of National Academy meetings. Um, those of you who are panelists, please make sure that you are muted. Uh, those of you who are in the audience and not a panelist, you uh, can be unmuted by us if you raise your question. If you raise your hand, uh, if you have a question, given how many people we have and the limited time in our agenda, um, we might not get to everyone, I'm pretty sure, in terms of the question and answer. So feel free to use that to put your questions there. Even if we can't answer it, you get an opportunity to put it into the record um, and we can go back both as a committee and as BOEM to, to look at them uh, at a later date. Those of us who are part of the committee, uh, you know, your camera, please have them on uh, when you're talking. Next slide, please. So the goals for today is to introduce the public to the committee. So this is our second meeting. Our first committee was a closed uh, meeting just amongst ourselves, just to get to know each other, uh, understand a little bit of, you know, our impressions of our statement of task. Today is really to hear from BOEM about what their uh, expectations are with regards to our committee. Um, and so that's really what the goal is. Um, and they are, they are our committee sponsor. Next slide, please. So what we're gonna do as a committee, we'll come on each of us and introduce ourselves uh, very quickly. Uh, and then Caroline uh, will go off and uh, discuss some of the additional details. So I've already introduced myself, Daniel. Yes, uh, hello everyone, uh, Daniel Doolittle. I'm a principal environmental scientist at FUGRO, and I also lead FUGRO's uh, environmental services uh, business in the Americas. We are responsible for doing a lot of the benthic uh, habitat mapping and essential fish habitat mapping. And I also have a background in commercial fisheries management with NIMPS and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. So that's me and I'll pass it over to Janet Duffy Anderson. I think she's on a, a phone. Janet, are you there? Um, I think we're going to skip over Janet for now, um, and we'll go to Trisha. Hi, everyone. My name is Trisha Yadley. I am the Atlantic Coast Offshore Wind Policy Manager for the Nature Conservancy. And I will pass this to Stephen Joner. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Joner. I'm a fishery management biologist and consultant with the Maca Indian tribe in Washington state. And they're a tribe that has uh, large commercial fisheries. I also work with the other uh, treaty and coastal tribes in Washington and tribes in Oregon and California. Eric? Yep, hi everyone. Eric Kingva, I'm the executive director of the Hawaii Long Line Association. Thanks. And then we have two committee members, um, Sarah Maxwell and Daniel Kipnis, who are unable to join us today. We'll go to uh, Steve Skyfers. Hi, everybody. I'm Stephen Skyfers. I'm an associate professor at the University of South Alabama in the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. And I can pass to Ron. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ronald Smolowitz. I'm a technical advisor to the sea scallop industry in uh, New England and along the Atlantic coast. I have my experiences in surveys, exploratory fishing, and gear development. On to you, David.
David, can you unmute and introduce yourself? We will. Um, so that is our committee. Um, if David jumps on, we'll give him a chance to introduce himself, but um, to keep this moving so we have more time for um, the presentations and, and questions, um, I will uh, jump in and, and take us to the next slide, please. Uh, my name is Caroline Bell. I'm the staff officer responsible for this project. Um, I'm at the National Academies Ocean Studies Board. Um, so as you can see on the screen here, this is the Standing Committee's Statement of Task. Um, this is the uh, what sort of binds the Standing Committee and, and really um, what the staff at the National Academies and BOEM work together um, as we were forming this committee. Um, the Standing Committee is slightly different than, than some of our other National Academies activities. Um, it is designed, um, as the first paragraph talks about, to be a collaborative um, pro, a collaborative meeting, a collaborative group to um, work with BOEM to um, hear from different stakeholders and sponsors around um, offshore wind and fisheries, um, and we'll meet regularly to discuss kind of topics here in these three bullets. Uh, the meeting today, as um, our chair, Jim, mentioned, is designed for the committee to hear from BOEM for the first time and get their perspective on really what, what BOEM wants to see this committee um, reach, what, what it, it is going to do in the future. Um, so it's, it's a chance for the committee to um, ask their questions and make sure we have clear guidance um, as we move forward, um, understanding what the, the role of the committee should be um, going forward and making sure that we're meeting all of BOEM's goals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so many of you um, have been to our webpage to register for this event, uh, but I also wanted to point out here um, on the National Academy's uh, Ocean Studies Board main page, um, there is a chance to connect with us. Um, it's where the red arrow is pointing on the screen. Um, if you enter your email address, you'll automatically get um, notifications when we have future meetings of this standing committee. Um, and then also over under the R work side, there's a link directly to the standing committee webpage where all of our, our future meetings um, will be posted. Um, so it's something to, to keep in mind. Next slide. And then just to reiterate, um, we are in a Zoom webinar um, for committee members and members of the BOEM, BOEM team. If you're not speaking, please keep your line muted and video off. Um, panelists uh, can use the raise hand feature to ask questions. There's also a Q&A feature um, that we would ask the attendees to put your questions in. Um, and attendees also have the opportunity to upvote questions. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time for questions, and the focus will be for the committee to make sure we understand the needs of the sponsor. Um, so most of the questions will be prioritized for committee members, but if there's additional time in the public viewing, we will uh, it ask, uh, reach out to members of the public, either through the questions that you've submitted in the Q&A, um, or if you have your hand raised, that's something that staff, we can call on um, people to unmute and ask a question. Um, we will be keeping track of questions that are put in the Q&A, and if there are things that we don't get to today and can answer the future time, we will get back to uh, registrants that have questions. And with that... Caroline, before we just move forward to the introduction, um, there, I will say there are some questions in the Q&A right now with regards to the participant list. Will the National Academies be putting out the list of participants on the website or link to that? Is that standard to do? Um, that is not standard practice to, to put out a, a link of, of registrants um, for meetings. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and Safa, if you wouldn't mind stopping screen sharing.
and I will go ahead and turn the floor over. Our first speaker today for the committee and the public is the director of BOEM, Elizabeth Klein. Welcome and thank you for taking the time out today to speak with us. Sure, thanks so much, Caroline. Um, and thank you to everybody uh, for taking the time uh, to join this meeting today. Um, I am Liz Klein, uh, the Director of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, um, and really on, again, on behalf of the Department of Interior, on behalf of the entire BOEM team, thank you uh, for being here and, and um, uh, uh, committing some time to these important issues. Um, this is the, the first meeting, as was described, the first public meeting of the National Academy Standing Committee for Offshore Wind Energy and Fisheries. Um, and before I uh, launch into my uh, remarks here are just uh, by way of introduction. I think I'm rounding out my third month uh, as director of BOEM. Uh, we have a really fantastic team uh, working every day on uh, offshore wind and on all of these important issues. Um, uh, although I am new to BOEM, I'm actually not new to the Department of the Interior. I joined uh, the Biden-Harris administration at its beginning in January of 2021. And I also served at the Interior Department during the Clinton and Obama administrations uh, and, and during the Obama administration, actually, uh, while I was in the office of the deputy secretary, worked very closely with Obama on a, a range of issues, including at that time, the, the start of the renewable energy program. So I'm excited to be back with the Boeing team um, and certainly excited about uh, this new committee and its work and uh, the promise it holds um, to provide us with some really excellent feedback uh, and counsel. So, um, you know, the, the Biden had a Paris administration from uh, its very first day uh, has been working hard um, on a number of fronts and made tremendous progress uh, since that time on uh, its goals to confront climate change, create good paying jobs and begin the nation's transition to a cleaner energy future. And offshore wind energy is playing a uh, major role in that transition and in those the goals of the Obama administration. Uh, at the same time, fishing is a crucial part of many uh, of our nation's coastal communities. It contributes to our food security, jobs, and economic opportunity. And beyond that, we know that for many, it's 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 something much more. It's a it's a way of life, and it's a valued part of our uh, individual and national heritage. So while BOEM is working to achieve the administration's renewable energy goals. We are trying to do so in a way that ensures fishing in all its forms and associated ecological, social, economic, and cultural implications uh, will not just coexist with offshore energy, but can thrive. Um, we are also working very diligently to avoid and minimize impacts to the ocean environment and marine species. We're committed to working with and expanding and improving our communication with the diverse fishing community throughout our process. So that's why we asked the National Academies to establish this new standing committee on offshore wind energy and fisheries. We expect this committee to be an independent and credible forum to discuss pressing stakeholder concerns and relevant science and knowledge associated with offshore wind and fisheries. Uh, Caroline gave a little bit of a snapshot in that slide about the statement of tasks uh, but to, to reiterate and, and, and highlight those, um, some of the things that we are asking this committee to do include discuss key topics uh, on, around BOEM's activities related to offshore wind and fisheries, provide broad stakeholder insight on a variety of offshore wind and fishing issues. Um, that kind of input is really crucial uh, to provide context and understanding to the Bureau's leadership, to all of our team working on these issues to support um, our decision making and to support uh, discussions around all of these issues. We're also looking for the committee to provide expertise, uh, including scientific and other areas of knowledge on offshore wind and fisheries issues through discussions like this, presentations and other means of communication. So again, we're just really uh, very excited about the committee getting started in its work. 
Um, you uh, were introduced here to uh, many of the folks on the committee, uh, not all of them, but uh, the, the majority of the folks on the committee, they do represent a diverse group of representatives from tribal nations, commercial and recreational fisheries, scientists, non-governmental organizations, communities, and the offshore wind industry. Um, of course, we know that uh, no one committee can represent every single interest, um, but we did, uh, we are, we are um, heartened by the, the diverse group, group of representatives on this committee um, that you see here today. So we know that fishing communities and other fisheries stakeholders are really critical to informing our offshore energy development process. We've been working hard throughout the beginning of the program and uh, through to today uh, to make sure that we are engaged uh, with fishing communities and, and fishery stakeholders. Um, and we know that as uh, the committee members that you see represented here, you all bring together a high level of diverse and independent minds to provide BOM with really important perspectives. So. We appreciate your expertise and the role that you play in our environmental science and assessment activities. Um, and I certainly look forward to working with uh, all of you and learning more as we move forward. I think as, as was noted, there are a number of folks from the BOEM team here today um, who will be uh, with you during this meeting and available to answer questions. Um, and so I'm, I'm just so grateful uh, for your willingness to serve and I'm grateful for all of the participants who have joined this meeting today uh, to listen in and learn. Shall I kick it back to Caroline? Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you, um, Liz, for your comments. Um, now let me invite um, Jim as well to turn on your video. And um, if there's any questions from the committee, we can um, address those. Sure, I, I guess I, I can start. Um, and Caroline, you please help me monitor the raised hands uh, for the committee if I don't see them. So thank you very much. Uh, we are, as a committee, excited to embark on this. I can already see from the question and answer session, this is a topic that a lot of people are very interested in. Um, and I appreciate you uh, highlighting the diversity of the committee, because some of the people have already mentioned uh, what is our background and, and how we're, we're going to you know, engage with you. Um, and I will just say that all of our bios are available at the National Academy website. You can go to the committee page and all that's available for everybody. But more specifically, you know, when you're envisioning this committee, I guess for our uh, understanding moving forward and, and with the understanding that, you know, our relationship will evolve through time, how do you see us interacting with uh, your decision making and your thought process on these uh, issues associated with offshore wind and fisheries. Again, you know, knowing that that relationship will evolve. Sure. Well, thank you very much for the question. I mean, I think as as uh, many of our decisions are made, there are a variety of uh, uh, inputs, perspectives, requirements um, on any given decision that Boeing makes, but certainly with offshore wind and um, the its uh, relation to impacts to fisheries and, and that set of issues, there are a whole suite of, of things to consider. Um, certainly the expertise and experience that committee members have um, and, and providing that to BOM uh, to understand, you know, if you are about to take this action, um, here are the potential implications, here are the things you might think of, here are the, you know, understanding of um, the state of the science and where additional uh, science and S assessment activities might be needed um, or warranted, right? I think that's a very important piece of this process is, you know, if there are, if there are questions and unknowns, which there will always be, um, how can we make sure that we are continuing to evaluate and adapt and, and, uh, and understand the, the, the range of those impacts and what types of measures we might take to address those impacts? Um, that's a really important part of what BOEM does. We have an Office of Environmental Programs that undertakes a lot of assessment work. We have uh, Bill Brown, who's on uh, today with us, uh, who works very closely with uh, Karen Baker, who's the head of our Office of Renewable Energy Programs, who is also on today and available to answer questions. 
Um, and certainly I'd invite Bill to, to chime in in any way if I've, I've missed a key point, but I think that's, you know, as you say, we want to make sure that we have open lines of communication and, and, and are, have a back and forth so that you are, um, understand the, the questions that we may have, you know, what are the things that the pieces of information that we might find most useful as we're undertaking our decision-making processes. Am I still on mute or am I off mute? Yeah, no, I actually, that, Liz, I think you said, <laughs> you know, I covered everything one needs to cover. And I, I would just add, though, to make it clear, the, uh, the, uh, this committee, it's, it, it is, we very much want this committee to be independent. And there, and 10 years ago, Bohm uh, was, was getting scientific advice principally uh, in addition to from the public at large to a FACA committee that we had, but we we have since then uh, uh, seen the the value of the national academies and in, in, as a regular source of advice, and we have a standing committee, another one which it provides advice on sure matters generally. But so, Jim, I mean, I have just a point to make. We, uh, every, you know, on top of everything Liz just said, we. Uh, you know, we 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 value your status as as genuinely independent of a bone and and the members of the committee being picked by the academy itself. So so and and I hope the audience at large notes that as well. Great, thank you. Does any of the other committee members have a question? For Liz, and I know Liz, you you have to step away in a little bit. So, um... hey Jim, this is Eric. I have a question. Great. Can you put your camera on? Yeah. Or if you did, I didn't see. I don't see. Yeah, you I pop just put it on. Thanks. The uh, question for for Elizabeth and others at Boehm: Are, are you going to be um, requesting the committee's advice on sort of a case by case, project by project basis, or just more uh, in general? I guess. Thanks. Uh, well, so thank you very much for the question, um, Eric. And I think um, if by project by project, you mean individual offshore wind projects, I don't know that that was anticipated as more, uh, you know, what are the, the items we can work on together that would have relevance um, across projects? And that might, uh, and obviously, and, I, and I, I see actually that there are already some questions, sort of the difference between floating versus fixed um, and sort of, you know, that there are geographic uh, um, perspectives here. So, you know, for instance, uh, the types of broad issues that might have relevance for uh, projects in a particular region, um, I think that's the, the kind of input that would be really valuable so that we are, um, that the goal is always to get to some level of consistency uh, in how you're treating projects. And so what are the types of things we should be thinking about across the board? Um, and, and again, invite, invite any of my teammates to, to correct the record or to add uh, additional. Yeah, the one thing I just would add on that is uh, uh, that is that, that uh, I expect our relationship with this committee will be very interactive with the committee members, and and uh, it's certainly been the case with our with our, our other standing committee, the more general one, where you know some of the meetings have been focused on on particular issues, and and the the, the academies help bring in uh, a range of experts that are the leaders on you know a whole range of things. Uh, um, for example. Uh, we had a really good meeting uh, a few years ago on on uh, on devices to sense different things in the ocean, sound, environmental DNA, you name it. And so we can focus on a topic, but we can also focus on on projects. And a lot of that depends on the committee itself. So I guess in a way I would throw it back to the committee that it you know we, we you know Bohm, the committee as well as Bohm, you know I hope will. I uh, will think about the issues that they think are important and and they'll come together as a mix.
Thank yeah, you. Hi, this is Karen Baker. I am the uh, the chief of the Office of Renewable Energy Programs, and I'll be talking and giving a little bit of an overview on the offshore wind in a little bit. So I, uh, some of this I was going to bring up, but since we're speaking of it right now, I, I want to just echo Liz and Bill's comments is, is when I was kind of approached and we were talking about this and, and asked, you know, what what do you hope to hear from the from this committee? And I immediately said, I really want to know what they believe we should be focusing on where should where with this diverse group of stakeholders uh in, in representing them these interests are there areas are there gaps are there things are there trends that we could focus on or where we could continue to improve our processes so maybe not a dive on each individual project however certainly as bill said willing to be very interactive and share some of the lessons learned from the projects and, and look where we may have um, opportunities to continue to improve our processes, to continue to uh, ensure that we um, bring the best data and science to mind, but also that we, we, we capture that from uh, wherever it may reside within the, the communities that are represented here. Jim, could I follow up on that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So um, I'm with the Makai Indian tribe in Northwest Washington. And there are a number of tribes that uh, have treaty rights to fish in the ocean and tribes that have uh, treaty rights to fish on salmon runs that uh, are dependent on the ocean. So um, one, one question that we really haven't had answered uh, from Boehm yet is, the cumulative impact of all the potential wind area sites on the West Coast. Um, there are two uh, lease areas in California, and then there are two uh, call areas in Oregon. But what happens in California can and likely will impact fisheries all the way up into northern Washington, even into Canada, because of the stocks that uh, uh, are produced and and reside in the California current ecosystem. So that's of very great importance to all the fisheries on the West Coast. And there's been a lot of uh, emphasis on the impacts to existing fishing operations, but not so much on the ecosystem. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that BOEM will be open to uh, our, our recommendations on that and will address this very critical question. Yes, thank you very much for raising that. I think it's uh, certainly something that is top of mind for us when we think about our um, the, the potential uh, leasing that might take place on the West Coast. Um, and certainly as we, as we move forward there, we want to make sure that we are evaluating the state of the science, um, understanding where gaps might be, and, and again, uh, considering uh, what type of measures might be appropriate. So I think you know, that um, if that's something that the committee uh, decides they want to look into, that would be certainly something Bomb would, would welcome. So I just want to follow up because Steve, I think that's a great example of how we can interact with <laughs> Well, for example, we could have a meeting designed around thinking about the science behind cumulative impacts and what do we know, what we don't know, whether that's, and that might be very different for cumulative impacts on the East Coast versus the West Coast, even to, given the structures, differences, et cetera. So I think that's a nice example for the for people trying to get some more traction on how this is going to work and and how we might interact with BOEM and what we might be able to contribute to this conversation. So thanks, that's a really good uh, example for us, sort of for everyone, I think. Okay, I think with that, as we are at um, 3.30, I wanna thank um, Liz Klein, the director of BOEM for speaking with us today. Um, really appreciate your comments and your time. Um, and we will jump to um, Bill Brown's presentation, um, if that sounds okay with everyone. <laughs> Great, take it away, Bill. Thanks everybody. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Um, yeah, all right, so uh, uh, I'm not sure who's showing the slides. Is it the Academy? Um, yes, we can pull up your slides. 
just a second. And, and let me say, I, I, I promise to be brief. Uh, I think I'm hoping I can save us time. And my, my role uh, is, is actually to do a very brief uh, PowerPoint on, on bone, what, it, what bone really is, uh, and then a, a little bit of emphasis on, uh, on the environment, because a lot of that, you know, the, the environment is it's, uh, a, a defining area for a lot of the concerns that I know will uh, be discussed here. So I, and Caroline, I mean, I can do it myself if there's a problem or Jessica Bravo can, but here we go. Okay, good. So uh, here's the title page and, and, uh, and that's me at the bottom. I'm, I'm the chief environmental officer of BOEM. Uh, next slide. So uh, this slide, number one, it shows you uh, the jurisdiction of, 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 of BOEM, the, the orange areas, that's the outer continental shelf of the United States. It's defined by a, a statute, the Outer Continental Shelf Land, Lands Act. And uh, basically, uh, there are state waters that go out either three miles, or in the case of Texas or the west coast of Florida, to nine miles, nautical miles. Uh, uh, beyond that, up until 200 nautical miles, the edge of the EZ is, is the outer continental shelf, and the outer continental shelf can include some areas uh, uh, somewhat further out than 200 nautical miles if they qualify as, as a continental shelf under the Law of the Sea Convention. <clears throat> and uh, the poem's basic mandate uh, which is that the, the first paragraph is uh, the OCS is a vital nat national resource, should be made available for orderly and expeditious development, subject to environmental safeguards. And uh, I would note that the territorial area, which you can see sort of in the lower left side of the slide, was just recently added by Congress uh, to the to the uh, BOEMS jurisdiction as part of the Outer Continental Shelf. And, we're moving forward with feasibility studies for offshore wind that are mandated by that same statute for the five uh, uh, territories that have uh, civilian populations on them, uh, the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, American Samoa, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands. Next slide. Oh, again, I know some of you know this well, <laughs> but some probably don't, so we, we thought it'd be helpful just to kind of show you the organization chart at the in the broadest way. Uh, it, it, at the top, the Secretary of the Interior, who reports to the President of the United States. There's an Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals who oversees not just Boehm, but Bessie and the Bureau of Land Management and, uh, and another office. Uh, then there's the Boehm Director and Deputy Director uh, with a corporate office. Liz Klein is the Boehm Director. And, and, and we have three programs, the, the Office of the, the, the Renewable Energy Program, the Strategic Resources, the Environmental Program, which is my program. And then we have three official regions, the Gulf of Mexico, Alaska, and the Pacific. We don't actually have a d defined region for the Atlantic, but that's where a great deal of the offshore wind activity that Karen Baker will talk about later is going on, obviously. Next slide. And this just shows you, uh, we're, we're, we're very small as agencies go within the federal government, about 600 employees, roughly, and a budget of about 220 million. And I've, I've already showed you the, <clears throat> I showed you the regions and, and uh, and uh, this puts a little flavor on it. We have a, 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 good, a good group of staff that are really national staff in Sterling, Virginia, near Dulles Airport. Uh, the, the largest office by far is in the Gulf of Mexico uh, in, in an area in near in part of New Orleans. And then uh, on the, in California, we have a Pacific office, Camarillo, and then we have a Alaska office in Anchorage. And we have 
these these what I what I'm calling development programs because the the, the program I had the environmental program is is it's the environmental safeguards. It's uh, so it's safeguards uh, that we need to carefully observe as we develop resources. Uh, and the the three development programs are renewable energy, oil and gas, and marine minerals, other than energy. Renewable energy is is uh, exploding in activity right now, and as I said, Karen, we'll talk about that. Oil and gas, historically, until recently, was was the principal uh, uh, program that BOEM was regulating. Uh, and continues to regulate with much activity in the Gulf of Mexico and, and limited but significant activity in the Pacific. And then the Marine Minerals Program is longstanding as well, largely focused on sand and for restoration after hurricanes and, and also used to make islands for wildlife nesting. Uh, and then uh, we're quite interested in critical minerals you know, with a priority right now to do environmental science to understand the, the ecological context in which they sit. Uh, and then the, at the bottom there to note, uh, we were uh, we were mandated by the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law to issue regulations for carbon sequestration and our carbon injection into the OCS. And we're working on those regulations and an associated program right now. Next slide. So for the environmental program, you can describe it with four bullets as here. First of all, that its focus is environmental protection to avoid harm or to minimize harm where it might occur. Uh, we integrate science and analysis. Uh, we do a fair amount of science ourselves, but we use science from other sources as well. We are the home, the principal home within the Bureau for uh, tribal program work and environmental justice work, but that is both those uh, responsibilities are bone wide responsibility. So we're, uh, the environmental program is support is really a support service for those broader functions. And then I, uh, Maybe the academy will like to hear this, but it's we we see the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, and our relationship with with those academy with those with the academies uh, in a number of ways is being critical to the uh, credibility and good information uh, for what we do. Next slide. So on the on the research side, we do have. For 50 years now, the Environmental Studies Program, it serves all of BOEM. We have people, uh, employees throughout BOEM in the programs and the regions who participate in the uh, uh, Environmental Studies Program. Our, our, <clears throat> our environmental program is actually, if we can way to describe it, is probably it's been it's distributed across the Bureau. Uh, this Environmental Studies Program uh, is it was authorized and mandated by Section 20 of of OXLA, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. We have we have we have spent over 125 billion dollars since it was established in 1973 on 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 what I would call critical research to understand the environmental impacts of what we authorize. About 30 million a year is spent, and you can look at the results of the studies on online as noticed here. Uh, next slide. And coupled with that is our environmental assessment function, which we should just like for, for the studies program, we have staff who are experts in environmental analysis who are in all the programs and all the regions, as well as in the headquarters office. And, and what that staff does is it takes science from our studies program to address everything on this circle uh, you know, when an activity is proposed for authorization, like offshore wind or oil and gas leasing, marine minerals, you name it, uh, you know, we go through the environmental analysis process, describing the environment, assessing impacts, engaging stakeholders, coming up with mitigation measures to avoid or minimize impacts, and then 
that feeds into decisions on projects and and from the results of that we 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 often identify additional research needs that we have so it keeps rolling in that circle next slide and uh just to say a little more about the travel program and i won't <clears throat> i won't read this slide but it's a top priority of this department and the administration uh, i it, it 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 begins with uh uh, uh, an effective consultation program, but it goes beyond that because we have trust responsibility for our relationship with tribal nations. That's more than involves more than consultation, and and uh, we're very involved in that. Our and our effort is is uh, led by Hillary Rennick, who's our tribal liaison officer. And next slide, I think that may be it. Yeah, there we go. So. I could say a lot more, but I'll stop there. And if there are any questions, I'm uh, happy to try to answer them. And of course, I would invite any of my colleagues that are uh, participating to speak up if if they want to, to for questions. Thanks, Bill. That was very valuable. Um, I'll open it up if any of the committee members have a question. Trisha. Hi, thank, thanks for your for your presentation, uh, Bill. I'm wondering if you can just clarify a little bit more about the, or talk a little bit more about the relationship between the different um, programs. So you had a slide that showed the renewable energy program, the environmental program. I think there was a strategic resources program. I don't remember everything on that slide, but just you know there there are a lot obviously inter, a lot of overlap and intersection um between i imagine between yeah. the work you're doing in your program and and the renewable energy program and i'm just i just would like to understand i guess a little bit more about how you work how you work within foam to align and to coordinate on your efforts so that you're kind of feeding information to each other um yeah, no, that's, a, that's a good question. It's, and it's one that we we talk about among ourselves a lot to try and make sure we're as uh, efficient and as effective as we think about it. It was is a, really a local decision, local uh, transaction. Then the regions typically would have the lead on that and. And and my office is is uh, on on the assessment side at least. I'll start with that. Uh, tries to focus as much as we can, principally on 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 this, on environmental issues of a national level and across regions. For the studies program that I mentioned, the studies program uh, it's it's probably a, actually a very good way to describe. What is very effective, I think, coordination where it's headed by Rodney Cluck, who's uh, in, in my immediate office. He's a, a directs the division, he has that program. But there's a whole team of researchers or people that manage research funds who are in, in the regions and all the programs who, who every year propose uh, studies and they develop study for profiles. And there's a there's a fairly uh, um, a uh, well-established mechanism now where where the you know, the, uh, the staff that are doing that get together and they you know they, there's a limiting factor which is how much money we actually have and so they you know kind of negotiate figure out what are the most important priorities and actually use a a, a, a strategy that we developed in consultation with the academies with the the committee on offshore science and assessment. So we evaluate priorities. We, we usually, by the end of the day, we have a consensus, uh, you know, uh, and it, it includes all the programs and all the regions, including offshore wind. And, all, and historically, offshore wind was a small part of, the, of that pie, and it's now it's the principal part of the pie in terms of money. So it's reflecting these, uh, uh, you know, changing priorities. And then, and then the, the uh, 
every year the basic decision on budget for research could then after it's usually worked out goes to the bump director to Liz Klein now to for approval um and then with with uh I, I like, you know I'm interested in seeing what Karen Baker will say exactly about you know the the, the way in which the the you know the environmental program staff that report to me and the and her environmental staff in Iraq, but it's they work closely together. Um, the uh, uh, you know we I, I I try to help that program by making sure that we're addressing issues that you know where we have sort of deep expertise, like on the North Atlantic right whale issue, for example, Jill Lewandowski, and and then we, we also have in the national uh, program. Uh, environmental program, this uh, Center for Marine Acoustics, which is, we stepped up just the last two or three years and has deep expertise in acoustics issues that are relevant to offshore wind, uh, if, you know, as well as oil and gas, but offshore winds much in, much in, in, in uh, much in the wind right now. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it, it a lot, uh, I hope that helps, it helps you understand it. It's, there are some bright lines, but they're not that bright. And so we tried to work together. I was just going to say it's a benefit of a, a small organization. I work, you know, literally just steps down the hallway from Bill and, and our teams work together almost so closely that sometimes you know, when we start to, to look in and ask who's engaged on this, we'll find that they have already come together and 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 collaborated and and I think we we definitely rely on each other's support and uh, as mentioned the studies our team is very involved in helping to shape that and requesting and 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 there and and Bill has a very collaborative process by which we do that so we do try to coordinate and and collaborate across all of our our program areas to the extent that we can. Um, again, given the fact that we are so small, there's some benefits to that, uh, that we <laughs> can, can, can do that, a pretty flat organization too. Um, but uh, I think also just the, 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 the tremendous need and, and again, the interest and expertise of our, our teams, um, we, we tend to, to, to try to, to share and, 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 and leverage each other as much as we possibly can. Great. Thanks. Uh, I think Steve has a question. Thank you. Um, hi, Bill. This is Steven Cyphers. Uh, I was I have a similar kind of type follow up question. I was curious if you could talk a little bit about how BOEM uh, collaborates outside of the agency, specifically for fisheries, uh, you know, related to NOAA fisheries and some of the state resource management agencies. And uh, kind of a, a related follow up would be if that differs for ecosystem type impacts or social impacts, if you were looking at social impacts on, on stakeholders, uh, what those types of collaborations are like and how BOEM just typically a, a approaches collaboration outside of the agency. Yeah, I, well, I, so a great, great question that, uh, I mean, I, I think the quick answer is we collaborate all the time all over the place with, with uh, uh, other agencies and others. Uh, the um, uh, on, I mean, to mention, for example, our studies program, uh, uh, we, uh, we try to leverage our funding. So, uh, you know, if we're not getting twice as much money spent on something that we need to work on by everybody else in addition to ourselves, we're, we're ashamed of ourselves. And NOAA is often a, 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 a partner. We operate through the National Oceanographic Partnership at some, so the Navy is often there. There are you know, many different agencies that 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 will kick kick into studies and help define them. One of the big areas that uh, that my office is really interested in now is a comprehensive ocean monitoring system to try to really strengthen that and put passive passive acoustic monitoring devices uh, out and so forth. And uh, so. Uh, so we push that. Um, uh, uh, Karen's office and mine are both staff and both offices are sort of deeply into sort of fishery, you know, marine mammal impacts issues and, uh, and working with NOAA and NIMPS. And Brian, I see Brian Hooker, for example, is on the line. He's, 
he's a, an expert who's who's uh, hugely involved in fishery issues uh, for uh, OREP, Karen's office. Uh, um, but on uh, the, uh, the right whale issues, we're both involved in Jill Lewandowski, who has our marine acoustics offices, you know, talking to NOAA, uh, uh, you know, every day, basically. And I'm not sure if I'm answering that perfectly, but there, the, the, uh, there's, really no, there's really no significant issue that we work on where we're not engaged with discussions with another agency and other players. Hey, Bill, uh, this is Rodney. Do you mind if I... Yeah, go ahead, Rodney. So this is Rodney Clark, who I uh, used his name in vain a minute ago. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in charge of the Environmental Studies Program. One point I wanted to make in addition to what Bill said is that, you know, by design, uh, we're able to uh, reach out to, to other universities, to other federal agencies, through interagency agreements, through contracts. We... Essentially, you can think of our science program as managing uh, science across the board. We're, we're very small, so um, we're not an organization that has does all the research in-house, like, like USGS, for example. So if we need work done you know, uh, in the Atlantic and we have a proposal competition and Woods Hole is the best to do the work, Woods Hole will do the work with our collaboration and working with us. They might be in collaboration with NOAA NIMPS or other entities as, as well. So we are able to actually be nimble, uh, go to the best out there, uh, the university or other federal agency or private sector entity to uh, you know, do that work. So we don't take it upon ourselves to do it. We have our scientists in house, we just don't have enough to do everything in the entire uh, OCS. <laughs> so this is so our work is extremely collaborative in that sense. I hope that helps. I don't see any other hands from the committee members. So uh, if it's okay with Bill, I think we'll move forward in the agenda. And Caroline, I, based on the q and I think at the end, we might spend a little bit time for those un, to explain a little bit more about what the standing committee's role is and uh, what our task is again, just to help clarify some expectations. It seems like, People are asking what we're going to do and, and maybe not have a good idea of how uh, our standing committee will function. So if we have a little bit of time at the end, let's let's come back to that. Uh, yes, Jim, that was definitely something I was thinking of. And and also um, saying a few more words about the National Academy's um, role in this process as well. Um, so thank you. So, Karen, if you are ready, we will pull up your slides. Sure. Um, I feel like we've covered some of this already, and I know much of this is, uh, again, uh, very much introductory, and, and as a, just to make sure we're all on the same uh, uh, page in terms of just the level of understanding. I know that that many of you, I mean, even as I was looking at uh, names and committees and members in such a, we may have engaged at certain times. I know that uh, many of you are familiar with BOEM, may be familiar or have uh, seen uh, at least a part you know, of our uh, information about our program, but I wanted to uh, again. This is this is kind of a very kind of basic overview. Happy to have some additional conversations, and and again, also very excited for the standing up of this committee. I am looking forward to a very interactive process with you. Uh, totally acknowledge the conversation already about cumulative. I think that's something that we'd love to have some larger conversations, but there's so many things that, as I mentioned, um, we're interested in what's of interest to uh, the, the communities that are represented by this committee uh, as much as we are looking to share with what we're, we are doing, but we're really hoping to learn and have some, some shared learning experiences as well as uh, uh, some just an ongoing interactive experience. Uh, and so, very, very excited to this. I am, uh, again, Karen Baker, Chief of the Office of Renewable Energy Programs. I am uh, fairly new in the role, uh, a little bit less than a year now. And, and the more that I, I learn about uh, offshore wind and the, the various 
uh, communities that are impacted by the, the, it, it engaged in this process, the more I learn, I have to learn. And uh, with the fisheries, uh, especially with fisheries and the communities are represented here, we put a huge emphasis on, on trying to get out and, and engage. Uh, so I have had the, uh, the pleasure and honor of um, talking with tribes, of talking with fisheries management councils, of, of getting out and engaging with specific industry representatives and learning uh, a tremendous amount about what uh, is of interest to you and how we can engage with you. But this is just another wonderful extension of how we can continue to have that engagement as I'm continuing to uh, drive the program and 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 and, and work on um, incorporating all that input into all we do. And we can go to the, the next slide. Uh, again, this is the mission. I won't read that to you, but that we, uh, Bill already talked a little bit about all that we do in, in our each, each of our program areas. We go to the next slide. This is really where the uh, renewable energy comes into play. Of course, our authorities come under the offshore, uh, excuse me, the Outer Continental Shelf uh, Lands Act. Um, the Energy Policy Act of 2005 uh, it added energy from sources other than oil and gas and thus renewables and primarily offshore wind, although we do look at other renewable energies as well um, in a very uh, small, small, just a narrow portion of what we do at this point in time. We could go to the next slide. And I think Liz already mentioned um, the administration goals. Uh, and this is something that my team uh, is very aware of, we, we talk about this nearly daily and how we achieve uh, and advance the, uh, the administration goals of deploying 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, uh, 15 gigawatts of that uh, being floating offshore wind by 2035. And uh, very much uh, a uh, ambitious goal, but one that we're, we're seeing progress towards and I, I can speak to that in, in, in detail at any point. We can go to the next slide. Just a little bit about our process and, and, and BOEM's role within offshore wind. So we are responsible for the economic and environmentally responsible development of energy resources in the outer continental shelf. So we are, have uh, engaged uh, communities throughout our process. Uh, and we have, it's a pretty extensive process uh, one that's complex, this very, very simplified in this slide, and we can talk about um, uh, a variety, you know, areas, but primarily we start with planning and analysis. This is something that is uh, we, we do in terms of how we identify ideal wind energy areas, uh, a lot of science, a lot of modeling, a lot of collaboration with our partners at NOAA and others. Uh, we uh, do our best to uh, engage tribes, states, coastal communities, uh, fisheries, and, and all, all the, all, everybody who's impacted early on as we look at these wind energy areas. There's a, there's a, there's a, these are, this is very much a public process and it's an iterative process. So as we start to look at areas and we start to look at where can we avoid mitig and mitigate uh, impacts, uh, those areas become much more narrow. Uh, and then we get to the point where we publish lease notices and then uh, BOEM oversees the holding of an auction and the lease is granted. What the lease allows um, those developers to do is to survey uh, their land. I mean, their, excuse me, not their land, their, their, their lease area, the, the wind area. And so they are, uh, and so, and, and we oversee their, their plans and, um, and ensure that they are doing that safely. And, and, and then we, um, then once that's approved, they go into a site assessment survey and they develop their construction oper and operation plan, which, uh, and all of this up to date um, is about a five-year process. They must submit a COP within five years of the, the lease uh, execution. And then um, once that's deemed sufficient, we move into the, the National Environmental Policy Act uh, review, environmental impact statement review. So all in all, that particular timeline can take up to five to seven years. Uh, we have many projects that are in various phases at this process right now. And uh, we recognize that sometimes that's really confusing as we, as we speak to this and how, how we help people understand where we are in our processes and 
the many, many opportunities to engage with us and provide input. So I will go to the next slide. And this is just a, an overview sort of by the numbers. As uh, Bill had mentioned, a lot of activity on the Atlantic. And I should say, I, 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 by way of introduction to, uh, we do not have an Atlantic office. So in, in some ways I'm, I'm dual hatted in that I am really building our policy for national program uh, uh, while I, we are also engaged in the, the permitting of and, and the active um, monitoring of, of 27 active commercial leases um, it's all on the, the, the um, Atlantic Seaboard at this point in time. We have two projects that are under construction right now that, we, that are underway, uh, South Fork, uh, Long Island, and the uh, Vineyard Wind Project off of uh, the, um, Martha's Vineyard. And then we have uh, about 10 that are currently under uh, environmental in, impact assessment review. Uh, and, and many others that are in some processes preparing for, for getting ready for that review. So a lar large uh, portfolio, a uh, tremendous amount of uh, work, a tremendous amount of engagement. Uh, and then as, as you can see from the map um, and, and it was already mentioned, we have uh, had a uh, lease auction in, in California. We are just announced um, potential for Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act also uh, charges us to look at where there's opportunities within the territories. Uh, we, we are um, focusing um, early on on Puerto Rico and, and having those engagements. So a tremendous amount of work. Um, again, it, it's my team um, in terms of uh, doing uh, the, again, the Atlantic operations, but also advising, consulting, sharing those lessons learned across the board, but we um, have renewable expertise within each of our uh, regional offices that are working those regional uh, uh, projects also. So um, talking a lot with our Pacific and Gulf of Mexico offices as they are starting to stand up in, in this arena. You can go to the next slide. So how, when does BOEM engage with fisheries interests? And I wanna be very clear when we start to talk about fisheries interests, we are incorporating, just as Liz Klein said, uh, the, the, the diverse uh, community of fisheries interests. So this includes tribal interests, uh, commercial, recreational subsistence fishing uh, is all of interest to us and, and something that we wanna ensure that we have incorporated in, in our studies that we have considered those in our environmental impact statements and that we are getting that input. So um, there's, again, these are the uh, sort of the three areas on that long chart that I showed you in terms of those pre-lease engagements. Uh, as mentioned, there's, and we're working really closely at Gulf of Maine right now in, in terms of looking really early on and in, 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 because we were just about to, uh, we, we were starting to identify those wind energy areas. And so we have been having public engagements even prior to that announcement of the call for information so we can ensure that we're looking at the right things. And we've been talking with uh, a tremendous amount of uh, diverse fisheries interests in that arena. But again, there's a lot of engagement uh, in that early process uh, all the way to post sale notice. And then at the post lease engagement state, there's, there are opportunities under the construction and operations plan environmental review. And then as mentioned before, the environmental studies. So those are sort of more the formal uh, processes or, or, or opportunities. What we're very interested in hearing from, uh, from the this standing committee is how we better do this as well as how we get that, that great local knowledge um, I, as I, I mentioned, I've been engaged with a number of fisheries, fishing communities who will share that uh, they have tremendous amount of data. How do we get that incorporated into our models and to our considerations? We're very, very interested in how we do that and how we do it in a both a constructive way as well as in a way that is effective. Um, as, as Liz said, we want everybody to be able to thrive. Um, and we... Uh, very much recognize with the volume of work that we are doing that we have the potential, and I hear this from uh, across the board, to 
drown communities in a lot of data, and then we and and, and they're, they're 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 looking to how we can incorporate and uh, uh, how the, how they can give uh, effective input and how we can incorporate that. And so that is something that's that that's heavy on my mind always. And we we are very very interested in in, in leveraging your input on that specifically, but so many other areas too. Uh, next slide. That's the last uh, one that we have. Uh, there is just just wanted to make sure we had pointed out um, how you can reach out to us. We have a notice of stakeholders list. If you go to our website and click on the contact list, you can indicate where what you are interested in, and we will send we will keep you on our uh, regular distro list. Uh, I'm very easily found my Karen.baker at boehm.gov. Um, and uh, we're very interested. We, we, we have been monitoring some of the, the Q and A and um, interested in, and, and, and kind of coming back with specific questions uh, as, as we can. So I think that that's my last slide. Thank you so much and I'm ready for questions. Great, thank you, Karen. Uh, I'll open it up for the committee. If there's any questions. Or any of the, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, hi, this is Eric Kingma, um, committee member from Hawaii. In terms of the process and the, the initial kind of locations for siting and the environmental review, that's conducted. It seems like the environmental review is NEPA, other analyses is conducted after some of the, the siting areas have been identified. Um, has there been a review of, of Bowen's process to date in terms of maybe doing a little more environmental review prior to identifying uh, siting locations or areas of potential leases? Um, I think there are, my understanding is there's some criticism of Bohm's process that's a little bit um, out of step with maybe obtaining baseline information first or environmental review first. So I just wanted to ask that question. Has there been a review of the process and um, if that review of the process is, is public uh, that we could kind of uh, review for our purposes. Thanks. Well, we can certainly get you uh, some information to you know, anything that we can in terms of reviews and how to act and, and, and where, you know, and, and, and the effectiveness of our process. Uh, we're looking to improve it always. Uh, so I, I will say that that's something that, that but, but I want to be really clear. Well, well, we look well, we put those COPs, those construction operation plans that are going final and, we, and, then, and at that point in time where we know where those developers plan to put wind turbines, how they're going to, you know, and, and all the all the ones that we we're reviewing right now are, are fixed bottom. How that, what you know, what approach they're going to take, that that is really going through a full environmental impact statement in the NEPA process. But we're leveraging NEPA all the way through. I mean, there's an environmental analysis that happens at the very the beginning, uh, and and so again, to to kind of some of the questions we had about cumulative. Happy to talk about how we can continue to improve. Can, happy to share how we do our modeling, but but there is a there is an environmental review process all the way through uh, what we do. I think that it's challenging often uh, to really uh, get to specifics until you do have that. You know those leases are in place. We we look very tremendous amount of time, and especially right now as we are uh, moving into a number of other uh, you know wind and energy areas we know it's a busy ocean we know that there's only the you other know, that right now we are we we know that many of these wind energy areas are being used not not just for fisheries but there there's there's a number of other uh uses across the board and we look very very closely at how do we avoid how do we minimize impacts and, and we are leveraging our our team uh teammates at NOAA in some of their modeling, and as I've mentioned, we're trying to bring in uh, as early as early as possible as possible. Bring in tribes. How do we incorporate indigenous knowledge into that those modeling? How do we take what the fisheries want, would share? How do we and, and some of those engagements very interactive, very intense as we we look at this, um, and and we find it it's 
it's taking we, we have to invest more time and energy in that but i will i, I do want to be careful and state that we are following a nepa and an environmental process all the way through everything that we're doing thanks i didn't know if bill wanted to chime in or any of my teammates want to say anything more about that uh I, I might just say essentially what is something similar, and that is we uh, the focus of our deep analysis has been uh, initial review, like Karen said, uh, bef before leasing, but the but uh, but our policy has been and continues to be. Uh, to take the deepest dive in, in terms of environmental impacts once we have a lease and know and, and, and can know a good amount about what's going to happen there. But I understand, I guess, I, uh, Eric, I, I understand, and I'm sure Karen does too, you, you know, your question, which is, uh, you know, do, do, you, do you think you're taking a, a good enough look up front? And it's something we're thinking about. Yeah, and I think we'd, we'd love to, to talk more uh, again, we limited time here, but but maybe it's a topic we take on and, and, and we can provide a little bit more information about how we are identifying those and then what we've really cordoned off and, and aren't and isn't used for development based on what we all the different layering and modeling that we do. But as Bill said, yeah, the, the most extensive happens when we have that specific knowledge, then we can then we can incorporate uh, and again, we get feedback from NOAA, if they're a reviewer on everything that we do in terms of impact for uh, marine mammals, for fisheries, that those are all very much part of our consideration from beginning to end in this process. Uh, Jim, uh, maybe a, maybe a follow-up point of information and, and a question buried in there for Karen and, and Bill. Would, would you say that the New York bite lease process where we're talking about doing a programmatic review of, of the area is, is, a, is an example of how you're listening to uh, comments and, and, and the stakeholders and, and looking at evolving the rulemaking? Um, is that, is, can you speak to that? Yeah. Um... I could start, Bill, or do you want me to? No, start? no, you start. You okay. start, Karen. It's yeah, your, actually, your definitely. I, I think we're, we are, we are uh, New York Bite has been a, a pilot that, that we are moving forward with in terms of looking at that full lease area. In, 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 in I think it's six leases, if I'm, not, if I'm not speaking correctly, uh, off uh, off the coast of New York and New Jersey and, and looking at it collectively uh, first. Um, we're not certain yet. Uh, well, the you know again, it, we don't presume an outcome, and we're when we're conducting NEPA, we're not certain that we're not going to have to then move into specific uh, EISs on, on the COPS based on on what we're learning. However, we do believe that's more the, the the wave of the future in terms of how we're going to be doing things going forward. We're already talking. Um, I don't want to get too far ahead in decision making, but we're already having those conversations about California. We're already uh, we we've been having conversations with Carolina. There there's a lot of areas where we are saying it's 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 probably more productive in that regard to to look at that 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 broader region and and uh, and we're trying to see what we can learn from that too. It's it's a challenge. It it in terms of. You can do everything you do say we can avoid here and here, but then when you start to really get to the specifics of, as we're talking daily with our with our NOAA counterparts, where are those turbines going? What's going to be an impact at that location? Um, it, it 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 is it's a challenge, but uh, it is something that we think is worth uh, looking at in a much broader. And and I think we're already learning lessons from New York Bite. We're going to apply elsewhere. Was that a fair statement, Bill? No, it was a, a, a good, good question, a good answer, I think, to Karen. But no, you're right. We've, you know, this this whole program has evolved, and you know, at the beginning, it wasn't clear where it was going to go and what a lease really meant. And so, and we've been listening and and expanding our view and trying to ask really basic questions, like the a recent study uh, that we've asked the academy to do on the potential effect on on removal of wind energy on ocean circulation. So we want to make sure that we do get the best science we can on the basic questions. 
Yes, this is Dave Wallace, and I um, have a, a question. Uh, when we between um, southern New England and the Mid Atlantic Plate, we're going to have about 2,500 turbines, depending on what size they are. Uh, but they are all going to be much bigger than anything that has ever been built anywhere in the um, in the world or at least in, in Europe and the United States. Um, and there are a whole series of assumptions that have been made, which will be what the cumulative impacts are going to be of those 2,500 windmills on, on the oceanography, fisheries, habitat, and, and the wind energy, all of which you, uh, I keep reading, uh, new studies show that the wind wake is is not a couple of miles, it's a uh, hundred miles. And those things are going to have an enormous problem, uh, um, enormous negative impact on the whole system. And what are we going to do, or, or what are you gonna do when all of a sudden some of the assumptions that you have made end up not being true and they're going to have a much larger negative impact than uh, originally planned. Thank you. So, hey, Karen, let me let me back in. So, David, I, I appreciate your question, but I think uh, uh, we're very interested in the potential effect uh, uh, on ocean circulation. But I, but we don't know what the, uh, you know, we don't have good information. We the uh, the bomb or we the world really now on what those impacts are and that's 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 why we're why we've asked the academy to help us answer that that question i i think it's an important question but i think it's would be a big mistake to make to just assume what the results are so uh so note that the other thing i guess i would say is uh, I mean cumulative effects are really important and uh, jim i'm glad you brought that up it's really I feel like I've lived with cumulative effects discussions for most of my life. It just never goes away, but it's that's because it's always there. And you know, every NEPA environmental impact statement requires us to to do a cumulative effects analysis. And we did a, a major one with a supplement for Vineyard Wind, which I think many of you read. So you know, I'm not saying we solved all the answers to the cumulative effects question, but we, uh, but we have, but we've address them in, in, in actually each of these EISs that's moving forward. Uh, I, we know I it's important. I appreciate that, Bill. Yeah, first of all, just echoing Bill's comments and that I I think we that one of this is a great topic for us to, to have some much more extensive conversations with the committee about. And I think that we would welcome input. Uh, as as Bill mentioned, we do address that in each of the EISs that we do we uh, we are are reviewing. Uh, there is there are segments that look at the, the cumulative impact. I can also tell you as we're learning more and as we seek out new areas, uh, that's definitely the what what is already existing in terms of wind leases definitely impacts a lot of the decision making as well as. The decision making of many of our cooperating agencies and federal partners and, and others too. And, and so without getting into really specifics, then we have to continue to review that and lessons learned and what are we learning if we had an area that we were avoiding uh, or we had not marked for avoidance. Sometimes we're hearing now, well, now that we know that there's so many turbines here, that's going to be something that we're going to be thinking about. So there's probably more discussion in that that than but then, then is realized. However, I, I just echo Bill's comments is that we would really welcome some assistance with the from the academy in, in terms of addressing those questions and, and making sure we are answering that fully. Great, thanks. Bill, I'm a little scared about the expectations you're setting when you say the academies are gonna answer some of these questions. <laughs> I, I'm afraid that that's not the right expectation, but I love the uh, confidence. Well, and uh, I do, and Jim, the, you know, I, I, I know, I know the rubric with standing committees, and and I know what you've been told, and that is that the standing committee makes no recommendations. It's the, it's the insights of of you as individuals. And David, I appreciate your, 
your perspective, but I am hoping that the, that the study that we've launched, a uh, consensus uh, report on, on uh, it's sort of the potential effects on changes in wind energy on circulation. It, you know, it, you know, uh, it, it, it's not that it would be that I, that I think any of us expect that will, you know, give us a, you know, a crystal clear answer, but what, but what the Academy does in my view, I've worked with the Academy a lot and, and, uh, was on the Dells committee for a time, and and uh, uh, you know it, it it's the best place to go for it's kind of like, like the, the you know the the, the the closest one has to a really balanced uh, 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 view of what scientific you know people that are you know uh, schooled in science and experienced in science think is the situation amounts to. So I, I, you know, I don't think we're expecting you to solve the problem. That, to have that and, and I appreciate you keeping yeah. us on. So when I said the committee, I, I meant the individual representatives here. So definitely looking forward to that, that, that conversation. Yeah. So there you go. All right. Uh, there's a couple of questions out there. So Trish, do you want to jump in? Sure. Thanks. Um, okay, I have I have so many questions actually, but but I know there's others in the queue, and we'll have more time to talk. But uh, so I'll just do. There's like kind of parts to a question. So I know so much of our um, decision making about siting, adaptive management, the types of monitoring we're doing is really data dependent. And so the first part to the question, I'm just curious about how how an AFOM has talked about what its role is, if any, in driving innovation um, in in the in the development and design space, you know, with respect to material selection, design, habitat creation, delivering environmental benefits or improving ecological function, you know, what is the role, I guess, in incentivizing innovation for BOEM? Or is that something separate? And then the second part to that question, I think Karen, you you kind of alluded to your working with um, NCA. Oh. On working with NCAS on the modeling um, and assumptions for areas, you know, area wind energy area selection. And so this just goes back to the former question about how are you coordinating, you know, Bill, how does your program kind of respond to those needs where NCAS is saying that we have data limitations that could help help us better inform wind energy area selection. How does that make it into the research budget and that type of thing? Um, or into, you know, are they are they contributing to that research priority conversation um, as you're thinking about the environmental program? Well, the uh, I, I, I'll start. If it's okay, Karen. And actually, Karen. So Karen is uh, she, she has she has the whole shebang when it comes to offshore wind, and it's not all environmental. And and there's innovation that's not environmental. And and uh, you know, I, I, it's I, the, 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 that's her beat and not mine. But uh, on on environmental innovation, we're we're doing everything we can to to move that forward. We're, in fact, we've we're hiring a, a senior uh, a employee uh, to sort of lead uh, lead uh, the putting together of what we think will be a new center. We don't have formal approval yet about that. So, but uh, for innovative monitoring, and we and we have uh, with a lot of work, we've secured. Uh, nearly $7 million to, to begin to deploy a passive acoustic monitoring network. Um, we've been very supportive of environmental DNA and supportive of using uncrewed devices and, you know, all, all part of that to stay. And we're not, you know, we're not like, a, <clears throat> we're not DOE. We can't do, we don't have the money or people to do a lot of research and new technology, but we can ask the academics and scientists and other agencies that want our money to do certain projects to give us their ideas on how to use things like eDNA and so forth. In other words, to be innovative. So, and and there are just many players on that. Uh, um, but, but you know, it's kind of the heart and soul of what our studies program is trying to trying to do right right now. 
So Tricia, you asked a question that I've just posed to my team not too long ago. I mean, I, I how do we incentivize that? You know, and how do we evaluate new technologies? Uh, and and, and um, well, Bill has the environmental you know aspect here with Boehm. I, I do have an environmental science degree, and I as a leader uh, within um, my, in my previous roles in in, in sustainability and, and 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 leading innovation and and. and and, and thought on that. And so it's something that's, I'm passionate about personally uh, and how we can work through that. And uh, and again, I, I mean, everything from what can we be looking at in terms of, as you stated, you know, how how we can benefit Habitat uh, with, with these projects. How can, and and I'm, I've been hearing as we go to different forums about Echo concrete about scour protection and and and, and things that, that that it can it can do. And so there, there's a, mil, a number of other things in terms of you know just in the in the you know, especially as we look at floating and, and a number of other things that we, where we're starting to say how how do we best you know as we're evaluating these encourage incentivize I don't think we have an answer on that yet but that is definitely something I think we're very interested in exploring in much more depth. Thank you. Well, both of you, thank you very much. We um, have about four minutes left and I feel like we should spend a little bit of time at the end here, just going over the standing committee and the National Academies and providing some of the audience members with some background uh, on the committee. But I will just like to close that. Thank you for your time. I think as we can see by how many people showed up to our little session here, how important these topics are for everyone. And I'm very happy to hear that you guys are so open to learning more and understanding that everything is evolving uh, as you go and you, you're really interested in getting our input. So uh, I look forward to working with you guys moving forward. All right, Carolyn, I'm gonna hand it over to you for three minutes or four minutes to sort of sum up some of this. Sure, thank you. Um, I do wanna echo Jim's thanks to you to our speakers today. Um, it was very informative for our committee. And um, we will likely be reaching out with a few more questions that we couldn't get to um, from the committee. But just as, a, as an overview, um, the National Academies, we are a private, a, a non-governmental entity. Um, we were reached out to by BOLM to, to establish this standing committee um, as a forum for open dialogue um, and really to um, help them interact with, with stakeholders. So really appreciate all of the public that um, have been able to join today to listen in as the committee really was able to gain more information from BOEM about how we will um, continue to uh, develop the standing committee moving forward. Um, this is just our first open meeting of the standing committee um, and design more as kind of informational gathering for the committee itself, where future meetings will be um, more uh, information um, that the committee and BOEM kind of go back and forth as, as dialogues. Uh, the committee, um, we really appreciate there were lots and lots of questions um, that I was trying to answer some as we were going through the meeting. Others, we will um, take both comments and questions that were put in the Q&A. Um, there was a lot of comments as well about um, potentials for future meeting topics, and that's something that the committee will um, digest as we plan um, future meetings. The, the next um, open meeting of this standing committee will be in a few short weeks um, at the end of April. Um, it is a, uh, up on the project website um, and registration will open shortly. Uh, meeting topics for that are being finalized and an agenda will be posted. Um, but really the goal of a standing committee from the National Academies um, is to provide advice um, to the sponsor on specific topics. Um, they are different than some of our other National Academies, pro, uh, National Academies activities, which are more designed as consensus um, building reports. Um, this is more open-ended where our committees uh, were, committee members were selected through um, an interview process. We had a large number of um, members uh, nominate personnel for nominees for being on this committee and a limited number of seats that we could fill uh, that had to cover a diverse range of topics um, and expertise and also regional areas around the United States. I know that 
And another piece with the committee members, um, you might not see that these are the members that have expertise in something that you think is specific um, to your region or um, your specific commercial fishery might not be represented, um, but members were chosen for broad range of expertise and also for their, their network and their um, ability to bring in other speakers to the committee. So it is not just this committee that will be providing advice to BOEM, but the committee will help shape the future meetings and decide um, topics in conjunction with the team from BOEM and bring uh, additional speakers in. Um, future meetings may also be in different areas of the country, depending upon topic, and um, there will be open portions of meetings where public can attend in, in person, um, depending upon space available. I just wanted to say thank you again um, to everybody that participated, our committee members, um, and final uh, questions. We will go through and look at them and try to get answers um, to questions that were not addressed. Um, any final thoughts, Jim? No, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, have a wonderful day. And a recording will be put on the website um, most likely next week. So this this has been recorded. Um, and thank you. Thank you all for participating.